Hello, everyone. This is um, Emmanuel Edwarte. I am a current content editor for Surge. Um, thank you for joining me this evening, and I hope that tonight I can offer you some valuable and relevant tips that can help you develop your academic writing voice and get your work published in academic journals like Surge. So, what do I mean by joining the conversation? What conversation are we joining here? When writing academically, you're joining a specific academic conversation where you present and argue your points, supported by your literature reviews and original research. A metaphor comes to mind, the Burkean parlor. It's a famous philosophical image from Kenneth Burke. To summarize this lengthy analogy, imagine yourself entering a room and you observe a conversation in progress, one that has lasted long before anyone currently in the room. You listen in and you offer your thoughts. Someone disagrees with you. Another agrees and tries to support your claims. The discussion goes on, and you see that you have to go soon. And by the time you leave, the discussion still goes on into the night. This is an analogy of academic discourse. When you write academically, you are joining a specific academic conversation, present and defending your points and supporting your statements with background knowledge of the current literature and maybe even your own original research. It takes a lot of skill to participate in academic discourse, to know what to say, how to say it, and say it well. And it takes practice. I know I'm no expert, but I do recognize the need for structure at a personal level. And I bring that to whatever paper I write and to manuscripts I review for search. The key thing to recognize is that when we write and attempt to publish what we write, we are entering into an ongoing conversation and never a finished one. So where is Surge in this ongoing conversation? To quote from the introduction from our most recent issue, Volume 7, Issue 1, as an open access journal, Surge is distinct as the only student-governed, double-blind, peer-reviewed MLIS journal in North America publishing graduate student scholarship. Over its seven years of existence, it has put forth over 50 refereed articles, and we do have quite a global readership as well. As a current content editor, I am reviewing incoming manuscripts alongside my fellow search editors who are also here present tonight. I am working in a wider editorial structure alongside one other content editor and a copy editor per manuscript, and we all review for APA style and formatting. I read through manuscripts, offer constructive criticism using a guiding rubric, and submit my recommendation for publication to our managing editor, who then puts together something called a compiled referee report, a CRR, who then submits it to the editor-in-chief, who then passes the decision for publication to the author. And these decisions, they are major or minor revisions recommended, accept and reject. It's important to note that it's typical practice for us here at Surge to have manuscripts go through at least one round of revision before potential acceptance. It's part of the process, as I'm going to be explaining later on. From starting with Surge back in January, I now see myself as a stronger writer, building upon previous undergraduate psychology research experience writing in APA style. I hope that this helps me in tonight's presentation to provide you with some useful insight into how a content editor thinks, which can help you in your own writing for courses and submission and possible publication in Surge. And on, on screen is an overview of our discussion tonight. Five advice points, a short exercise, an AMA, ask me anything session, and my concluding thoughts. Let's get started. Point one, write for a broader audience. Writing for a broader audience means writing beyond an audience of one, of your course professor and for a course grade, towards the wider LIS academic audience. For example, think of Info 200. We receive a lot of Info 200 papers here at Surge. The various information communities authors write about may be interesting, but the presentation of those ideas can be lacking at times, mainly because they were missing an explicitly stated thesis and core question, context, and explicitly stated rationale as to why their topic is important in academic discussion. Though the level of writing in these submissions may pass the course, it may not necessarily pass our double-blind peer review. 
the goal of which is to publish papers that rigorously adhere to APA format and contribute to the overarching scholarly conversation beyond the classroom. Think of the difference between a one-on-one -on -one cafe conversation to a full roundtable delegation discussion. When writing academically, you need to have a mindset that you're writing for a wider audience who may or may not know what topics you're writing about on the onset. You need to contextualize, provide good background information to build up your thesis and reach a diverse audience. The course paper is the cafe conversation with your professor. The research article is the UN Roundtable Delegation Meeting, the wider academic audience. The new ACRL Information Literacy Frame, Scholarship as Conversation, has something to say about this. To paraphrase, communication does not happen in a vacuum. It occurs in communities and in sustained engagement of a variety of perspectives and interpretations across disciplines and through new emerging means of communication. Everyone participating is responsible to make worthwhile contributions that move the field forward. You, the author of your manuscript, have the power to provide novel ideas and argue your thoughts with a thesis, provided that they are supported with a strong synthesis of the literature. Now some perspective as an editor. When I'm looking at a paper, I as the reader, I want to be told what's going on. State your thesis clearly and provide a strong context. If I, the editor, have to guess what your thesis is, then there is already a problem. If I see no core question, then there is no central point unifying the paper. The topic that you're writing on is not the question. The argument makes the core of the research article. And lastly, define your terms. Don't assume that people know what you're talking about when you're using a concept which may have multiple meanings across different contexts. Point two, provide synthesis, not rote description. The point of a literature review is to provide synthesis of the recent literature. This is not a report. Do not just describe the sources cited. Integrate them, find common themes, gaps in thought. Be informative more than descriptive. It's not enough to say that a particular person said this or that about some topic. Yet this also doesn't mean that you write broad, sweeping statements. All your material should be motivated by what is and is not in the literature. And after doing your research and presenting it to the reader, the question becomes, so what? What can the reader take away from your work? Is it a call for more research, targeted services to particular populations, a new way of doing things? With a proper synthesis of your material, you gain the right to provide your perspective and answer that question, so what, in your own way. Like a rocket blasting out of the atmosphere into space, well-crafted papers provide implications and takeaways supported by a strong synthesis of scholarly material that allow a topic to take off beyond what's currently in the literature. Dr. Anthony Benier, who is also present with us here tonight, our faculty advisor here at Student Research Journal, Surge, came up with this physics-based image, and he provides lots of structured literature review advice in Surge's inaugural issue back in 2011. I highly recommend this as an important read, and we'll provide you the link to it at the end of the presentation. As an editor, a literature review is not a play-by-play -play commentary of what's been published. Do not write up descriptions of the articles themselves with language that describes the people conducting and writing about the research being cited, or even descriptions of the context of a particular study under analysis cherry-picking content to agree or disagree with and criticize also takes things out of context and provides a weak theoretical foundation. Also, for literature reviews, don't put a methodology section describing how you found your sources. It may be needed for some courses, but not for publication. But do include one for original research. Point three. Provide guideposts for your readers. In your research process, you may have come across lots of relevant, strong, scholarly material, yet these materials are only as good as how they are presented in your paper. Provide your reader with logical structure and flow, with explicit, relevant headings and subpoints connecting back to the thesis. 
the answer to the core question is the paper's destination. And the headings as guideposts provide a path for the reader through your discussion of cited evidence. Think of all of this another way. Ever been in a conversation when a person jumps from one topic to another without any good segues and transition language or just outright changes the topic dramatically? Do you have any friends like that? Or at least maybe coworkers or anyone like that? And you just think to yourself, this is confusing. I'm a little lost here. It's also disruptive. Don't be that kind of person in your writing. In regards to proper structure, our typical pattern of scholarly discourse, especially in APA style, is introduction, context, which includes a novel question generated by the author, as well as the thesis clearly articulated, subsections that relate back to the thesis, and the conclusion, which is the reiteration of the core question, the thesis and the answer provided by the author, as well as the author's projection of future directions based on the current state of the literature. This is not fiction writing, where we're drawn in by the impressive use of imagery and creative diction. The worth of academic literature is determined by the author's novel ideas and synthesis of previous work in support of those ideas. The conclusion's content matches the thesis stated in the introduction, and all the other subsections follow and build up the thesis. As a reader, it can feel like you're losing your way if you can't understand what's going on from section to section in a paper. Your readers need to know why they're reading your work. As an editor, providing the standard APA headings is great, but it's just a minimum. You have the opportunity here to provide brief descriptive subheadings that help group your material into appropriate conceptual chunks and use good transition language. Readers will tire from long paragraphs with no directions. The goal is to present your arguments and evidence as clearly and cleanly as possible and remind them where they are in your paper in relation to your thesis. Point four, do not just turn in your course final paper as is. So what do I mean by a paper turned in as is? I'm referring to papers that authors have written to meet the requirements of a course assignment and then proceed to submit it to search for review. Many of these papers have no clear thesis statement or context, and the material discussed is at the level of description, not synthesis. Think back to what I said about point one. And for those of you who have joined us a little bit late, and also another person joining us right now, thank you for joining us tonight. Point one was this notion of writing for a broader audience. The idea that it's not enough to just like write for your course, coursework and for your professor, because your professor is ultimately the one who's grading your work, right? But in order for your work to translate into a research article, you need to have this perspective of writing, of writing for a broader audience. And so, check your work. Have others read it. Use your professor's grading comments and be prepared to rework your material. Our double-blind review, peer review process here at Surge will work with you as well. Authors submitting manuscripts to Surge will receive CRRs, which come with a decision to reject, encourage major or minor revisions, and accept. A CRR is a culmination of all the reports and recommendations from the peer reviewers. As Surge editors, we're asking very pointed questions about elements and execution of a given manuscript. We're basically having a conversation with the work as we go along. And we use rubrics to guide us in our processes. So, what are the rubrics? We have two sets of internal rubrics for both content editors and copy editors. What I'm going to be walking through next is the content editor rubric. This rubric is structured under three main criteria, conceptualization, execution, and value. Under conceptualization, we ask, are the core question and thesis statement clearly stated in the introduction and the conclusion? Are they connected throughout the subsections of the rest of the paper? 
are the core research problem and thesis introduced with key concepts and an outline of what will be discussed in the rest of the paper? Is strong evidence provided in the analysis and discussion? Are thoughts synthesized in a critical evaluation of the literature? And for original research, is methodology justified and applied well based on existing theory? Does the abstract contain the core question and thesis? Does it highlight main arguments and important findings? Does it help a reader determine its potential relevance? Under execution, is the structure cohesive from the introduction body to conclusion? Is there a logical flow from the thesis in the introduction to the thesis restated again in the conclusion? Are paragraphs and headings well structured and well phrased? Does the author have a consistent scholarly voice throughout the paper? Are statements supported by evidence? Does the author clearly make a distinction between their own ideas and the ideas of authors used as evidence? Are direct quotes used sparingly? Is it too wordy as a whole? And under value, are the sources relevant, recent, and scholarly? If any non-scholarly sources are used, are they justified? Are they contextualized? And is the work as a whole a meaningful contribution to the scholarly conversation? Does it address a current gap in the research literature? Does it reach escape velocity? And with all of that, that'll help dictate our final recommendation, again, of major revisions recommended, minor revisions recommended, accept or reject, as well as some additional comments that don't necessarily fit into the rubric, as shown here. And again, to reiterate what was stated before, each content editor fills reviewing a manuscript fills out this rubric, submits it to the managing editor, who then compiles it together along with a copy editor's rubric report to generate this thing called a CRR, the Compiled Referee Report. After it's been compiled by, been compiled by the managing editor, it gets submitted to the editor-in-chief, who then passes along the decision and the comments within the CRR back to the author. Now I've shown you the rubric. Now let's look at a sample CRR. So on screen right now, there are, there's going to be some sip, snippets of a mock version that I created for my own Info 200 paper. To summarize briefly what's going on here, my paper on psychology faculty members as an information community was given a decision of major revisions recommended. It works well for Info 200, but not for a wider LIS audience, because I was missing a core question and thesis, and I needed to narrow the focus for my material. And addressing these issues seems manageable within a reasonable time frame. Just remember, though, major revisions recommended is not a judgment of your writing ability. Here at Surge, we're here to help improve prospective publishing authors' writing. This is a learning experience, and getting the decisions of major revisions recommended is part of the editorial process. This is not a rejection. Though the manuscript needs work, it has potential to make a contribution to the literature. Now here's a sample reject with general comments. Reject is typically given when there is a significant overhaul required, such as papers that need to address numerous issues in style, tone, and content that affect how the paper as a whole does not reach a wider LIS audience. CRRs, besides the decision and the general comments, they also include specific examples where applicable. Think again back to the rubric. You will also see the compiled comments from the rubrics from the three copy editor, the three editors, one copy editor, two content editors. And you'll see how everything is compiled together here. CRRs, they include specific examples where applicable, and we do our best to provide concrete examples like whenever we can. Whenever we say, oh, an author has a particular issue with this or like this idea could be strengthened, we do our best to point that out for you in the CRR.
And as like I've just, what I've been discussing before, two key issues that arise are the lack of a thesis statement and the writing of more description rather than synthesis of sources. CRRs also provide specific examples of problematic trends that may arise in style mechanics, formatting, and APA reference and in-text citation issues as well. Along with comments about the abstract, just as an aside, as an aside we have a YouTube channel, SRJ, SJSU iSchool, where you can find last year's webinar on how to write strong abstracts. And also, again, as a continuation of that side note, tonight's presentation will be, is recorded and will be posted on that YouTube channel. These decision letters, regardless of decision, they can become a learning moment for authors, something that I'm proud of being a part of as a budding information professional aiming to impart strong research practices. Again, remember that we are willing to work with you here at Surge as potential authors if you are willing to put in the work to strengthen your manuscripts. As a content editor personally, I focus on finding the paper's core question in relation to the whole work. I also make a value judgment about the worth of the content in academic discourse based on content and presentation. Has the author crafted a strong synthesis and made an original scholarly contribution to the literature? Too many quotes, especially long block quotes, fail to contribute anything unique, and the author fails to make their academic voice known in their writing. Additionally, phrasing matters. Prescriptive language, the shoulds, woulds, ought tos, we need to do this, we need to do that, it's our duty to do this type of language. Coupled with writing in the first person, it's really meant for practitioner literature and not scholarly ana analysis and discourse. I personally try to see the potential of what a paper could be while balancing with what I see right in front of me. This is very tough, however, if I can't figure out what the thesis is in a paper to begin with, and if I'm getting distracted by numerous quotes and casual writing voice. Going back to the Burkean parlor analogy that I began our discussion here tonight with, you're entering a party of sorts with your academic writing. Though you're not going to be at that party for very long, be impressionable. Groom and polish your writing because you want to look your best. Don't copy others. Be yourself. Concision helps. Being, di being direct with your thoughts lets your readers know what you're really saying. Also, adhere to the particulars of the journal's writing style. For Surge, see our style guide. APA Style Blog and Purdue, Purdue Owl are also good writing resources, both of which are posted on that page too. It's also very helpful to have your copy of the APA publication manual handy. I personally keep my physical copy from my undergrad courses at the ready whenever I edit my own work and review for the journal. Now, let's take a break. Break. I mean by break an exercise. See how you can apply these concepts that I've mentioned. In the following three sets, I'm going to be presenting two blurbs created from articles published in Search. Vote for either A or B using the multiple choice button next to the raise your hand button in the participant console in Blackboard. When we're all done voting, I'll then explain the right answer. And right now, I'm going to be posting a link to these blurbs in chat to see. So if you can't see what's presented on screen, if it might be too small. The text formatting is better when downloaded. So if everyone is ready to begin, if you finish downloading to your desktop, um, please raise your hand if you're ready to begin. Um, okay, and if you're confident that you can read what's on screen, then I'm going to go ahead and change the slide now. So this is exercise one. And I'm going to put two minutes on the timer, and 
Size timer and begin. Okay, so thank you for participating. So I do recognize that it might have taken a, a bit to read through both. And the correct answer for this item is B. So the author, Anderson, does well in synthesizing the current literature on assessment for information literacy instruction, and does so with a strong, formal, academic writing voice, not using slang or colloquialisms, and she unpacks jargon and abstract concepts well. The author goes on to provide comparison across assessment strategies in light of the new ACRL information literacy framework. And the author uses quotes sparingly to emphasize particular points and to highlight the transition between the cited author's ideas and the author's own synthesis and proposal of novel insights. OK. Second item. Starting the timer.
Okay, so thank you for participating again. The answer is indeed A. This is Barrow's thesis right here, an overview of the paper. This is um, taken from her introduc introduction section. The author moved through context using the ALA's core values of librarianship to motivate the synthesis of evidence throughout the paper, all in a structured manner leading to the conclusion, where the thesis was reiterated and expanded upon with a discussion of implications in the form of a list of things librarians and LIS students can do to serve homeless library patrons. The author does well here in not writing in first person and using prescriptive language. If you want to explore this article further, I also like how the author provides informative subheadings such as Get Into Reading and Book Well, Literature as Therapy, San Francisco Public Library, Full-Time Social Worker on Staff, and Martin Luther King Jr. Library San Jose, Community Connections. The author lets the reader know what's going on in setting up content and in connecting that content back to the thesis. Okay. Final exercise. Okay, so thank you for participating. And I do realize that this one might have been a little bit more difficult than the other two. The correct answer is indeed B. What I did in this particular item was rearrange what Nolan originally wrote in the conclusion to generate a sense of finality, which is something that you as an author do not want to do when setting up future directions. The academic conversation is ongoing. And the author does well here in building up observations across two theological library collections in relation to how they classify Judaica, offering side-by-side -side comparisons from a small data collection analysis of item metadata taken from those two libraries. This allows the author to propose novel insights, as shown here, into the limitations of standardized classification schemes in this particular context and offer suggestions for future research. Again, thank you for participating in this exercise. Now let's move on to my final point. Point five, review the journal policies and your style guide before submission. Every journal has different policies and required citation styles. This information is usually captured in a journal's statement of aims and scope and its policies. What I have on screen is Surge's aims and scope. I've highlighted here that we're looking for excellent graduate student scholarship 
in LIS and its related fields. So then, what coursework matches these policies? Think beyond the final literature review assignment for Info 200. There are other courses, such as some sections of Info 285, Research Methods and LIS, that offer opportunities for manuscript submission of original research, as well as possible Info 298 special studies in which you and a full-time faculty member could collaborate on a potential journal publication. The Info 244 online searching section that I took, personally, had an option to do a final paper on a topic related to online searching. Other seminar courses, such as one section in Info 281 on metadata, have a literature review final assignment. There may be other seminar courses, even moral courses, which can have these kinds of options. But not all professors put the exact details of their assignments in syllabi posted on the iSchool site, so you won't necessarily know for sure if a course has an option to do a final paper. There is always the option to take the time to write a paper based on material from your course assignments, or write a book review. We also have a book review webinar on our YouTube channel. Let me get really candid here. I know I, I know I said a lot. And I realize that it's very, very easy to be critical of others' work more than my own. Really, psychologically, we tend to have blind spots in how we find errors in our own work, even me. As you write your paper, you've been in the material for so long that you can talk or write at length about it and have a strong, high-quality source list from your database diving. And because of this, you probably skim over key details on the basics and use jargon that others may not know about. You may even get away with using bad, unclear phrasing that makes sense to you in your head, and it may also make sense when you read it aloud. You may probably not even take the time to rev revise your work. Believe me, I'm guilty of all of these traps too. Yet psychologically, being aware of these biases helps me be critical of my own thinking about these issues, as I strive to polish a paper to the best of my ability, to make it worthy to be read by a wider audience. If you take away only one tip from this webinar tonight, remember my cafe conversation metaphor. Academic writing for manuscript submissions is not geared only to your professor or even us, search editors. It's for the UN Roundtable meeting, the wider, diverse academic audience involved in the greater scholarly conversation on your written topic. Now, putting back, my, putting back on my editor hat, whenever I see obvious writing errors, I automatically think that the author only proofread using Microsoft Word spell check. This is never enough. Please take the time and care to proofread. Check journal submission policies. Apologies for that, the audio cut out for me. Um, anyway, as I was saying, check journal submission policies and the style handbook during your editing. APA style particulars can fill up a whole other webinar, but I do hope that what I've talked about here helps you develop your papers conceptually, getting you through the door for the next round of revisions towards publication. Now, let me pose the same question that I ask myself whenever I read a paper. So what? What are the implications for taking the time and effort to get published? Getting published is a prestige opportunity that boosts your CV, resume, LinkedIn profile. This basically shows that you survived peer review, ideally double-blind peer review, the strongest out there, and made a meaningful contribution to the ongoing academic conversation. Yet possibly more relevant to us iSchool students in the short term is that getting published is great evidence for your ePortfolio. I'm working on the ePortfolio right now. I'm definitely grateful to have a publication come from my Info 298 work. That particular article demonstrates my ability to research, evaluate, and synthesize the literature and propose future directions for research and practice. It fits very nicely with competency L. And the material that I've written about could also be applicable towards the discussion of a global socioeconomic perspective for competency O. 
it was definitely time consuming, but well worth the effort. Hopefully this anecdote here may help you think ahead to your ePortfolios as well and see how publication can play a role. It's definitely never too early to start thinking about your ePortfolio. Now let me open this up for AMA. Take up the mic, put something in chat, ask me anything. All right, I see in chat that Sue asked um, what is the typical turnaround time for first reviews. Um, I know from my personal perspective that as a content editor in the wider editorial structure, my personal turnaround time is two weeks. But maybe if Holly, um, our editor-in-chief who is here right now, I'm just wondering if she can answer that question better for me because she definitely has a broader perspective of our editorial structure because she is the editor-in-chief. Holly? Well, I'm not entirely sure what's going on with Holly's microphone at the moment, but at least from what I remember her like explaining to me like during a review for in preparation for this webinar, she did mention that upon like an author submitting a manuscript, um she gives a first over like gives a first like overview of whether this article is indeed worthy for review. Then after that, it gets sent to us, like for the first round, for a team of two content editors and one copy editor. Our turnaround time is two weeks. And then after that, there is another week for the managing editor to compile everything into the CRR. So I would say a good month. That's just a personal estimate. And I see um, another question from Lan Yi says, I am a new student this fall. Do you think it's too early for me to think about publishing? Should I wait until my second year? For me personally, I think any time at any stage for your time here at the iSchool is a great time to think about publishing. For me, like I, I personally have research aspirations. Um, so I'm very happy that I was able to like start making my way towards that by getting something published. So if you want to think in terms of like getting your work published in Surge, definitely do think about your Info 200 paper, the culminating final assignment for the, the literature review for your information community. Just keep in mind my five advice points and conceptually I would hope you would be getting to a point where you're getting the decision of major, major revisions recommended. Again, that is not the same as rejection. It depends on a variety of factors, but as long as you like explicitly state what your thesis is, that already puts you in a very good place for us to give you a lot of great advice in trying to rework your material. Jesse writes, avoiding utilization of prescriptive language, but at the same time calling for a change using academic language, does this still conform to standards? Hmm. Conform to standards. So what I mean by prescriptive language, um, what is the difference between a magazine article that you see like American libraries versus a journal, like the Journal of Information Literacy? Both may talk about like the new ACRL framework, ACRL framework for information literacy, yet one is more practical. The magazine article is more practical in the sense that, oh, I'm telling, we're saying that, oh, this is a recommendation. It's written in a very casual, like easy, easy to read voice. 
and that includes the prescriptive language of like, we should be able to do this, um, let's be a little bit critical here, but the journal article, like say something in the Journal of Information Literacy of writing about the ACRL framework, they're going to say, oh, we're going to establish the context by saying, here's the evidence that was already previously written in the literature about information literacy. We're going to talk about the old standards in relation to the new standards. It's very systematic. So yes, both can like talk about a call for change, but one does it backed up with clearly stated evidence and clearly stated structured evidence backed backing up a thesis statement, whereas the magazine article, it's very straightforward, something, again, it's a magazine article, the tone is different. The audience could arguably be the same, but in the end, the utilization of prescriptive language is typically not in academic literature. And I see, hopefully that answers your question, Lanyi and Jesse. Um, Sue. SRG alumna note, back in the day, it was about 45 days. If the content editors are holding to two weeks, probably about the same or less. Better turnaround time most than, than most other journals. Oh, hello. Thank you for joining us as a former search managing editor, Sue. Um, definitely do like the fact that we do pride ourselves on having that turnaround time. Um, especially for me, like I do my best to not like even get close to the 14 day like limit whenever I'm doing my reviews. So how long is the paper in general? Um, Lanyi like and asked another question in chat. How long is the paper? Um, we can, just give me a moment here, I'm going to actually put this link in chat. So, let's see here. What I'm going to be putting in chat is our style guide right here. So for Lan Yi, how long is the paper in general? You can find the answers to that in our style guide. And the document length, just to say, is between 3,000 to 7,000 words for manuscripts, between 500 to 1,500 words for book reviews. If I remember correctly, um, the Info 200 paper was supposed to be a maximum of 3,500 words. Um, at least that's the way how I remembered it. So you are definitely in good shape if you want to tailor your Info 200 paper to a potential journal publication. You're in a good spot there. Um, let's see, Jesse says, thank you, hopeful answer, I am referring to use of slavery and production of our tech. Okay, thank you, glad that was helpful. Um, let's see, when is the next deadline? Okay, good question, Jesse. Um, the thing that I will mention actually at the end of the, end of our time tonight is that we are, our um, publication cycle, we accept manuscripts on a rolling basis. If you ever see that in another journal, like any other journal that you might want to submit manuscripts to, what rolling basis means is that that journal will accept manuscripts at any time of the year. So you could even submit one now after the webinar and it will go through our review queues. So however, rolling basis, ex like rolling basis acceptance like of manuscripts does not mean that, oh, like you're going to receive a decision like at that particular moment, obviously, it needs to go through the double blind peer review process. What this also doesn't mean is that it's going to get published right after it's been accepted. So we are, our journal is published biannually. So what that means, biannually, like we're publishing one in the fall, we're publishing one, one issue in the spring. So we have two issues a year. Let's see, what is the next deadline? Michelle asks, what kind of book reviews are accepted? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, in preparation for 
this webinar here, I um, did not actually prepare for that question. That is a little embarrassing. However, what I can do is send you this particular link. Just give me a moment. Mind you, like everything that I've spoken about um, tonight was based on my perspective, but all the technical details are on the Student Research Journal website. Uh, let's see here. What actually might be helpful, Michelle, is this particular webinar, which I'm putting in chat right now. We actually made a webinar about a book review last year, and this was made by one of our former content editors, and hopefully that could be useful as well. It's basically a webinar like what we're having tonight, and it's um, posted on our YouTube channel. So book reviews. Um, just to clarify even further, book reviews are on, really only for academic LIS journals. Mind you, academic. There is a suggested um, book list for you to review if you don't know what you want to review. You could always email us too. Like email us at, let's see, what is our exact email address? Our email address, I'm also going to be putting that in chat as well. You can feel free to email that to us. Email us at sjsu.slis.srj at gmail.com to um, see if a book that you might have in mind would be suitable for a book review. All right, so Lan Yi is asking again, I am new but very interested in publishing an article. My goal is to be an academic librarian. Very good aspiration. When should I, where should I start? This webinar is very helpful, but is any course you recommend for research, academic writing? Um, really, just going back to Info 200, it's all in the core courses. Um, Info 200, Information Communities, and Info 285. Um, Mind you, there really is no set order to, like, of, at least in my understanding, there was really no set order of taking Info 285 research methods in library information science. There was no particular order that you had to take that, like, say, oh, right after you finish Info 200, 202, 203, 204. Um, for me personally, I took it in that particular order. That's why I felt I was gaining that perspective for at least doing, conducting research in LIS. Suzanne is asking, what percentage of manuscripts submitted are published? Ooh, um, I'm going off of memory here. Please don't quote me on this um, per se, but I remember in a meeting back in, back like in an editorial meeting because we ha as as SRJ editors we have editorial meetings if, like at the end of every month and during one of our um, meetings back in the spring semester our former um, editor in chief mentioned that our acceptance rate is i believe 15% it's very very strict but mind you if you get through that's very very like very very amazing that you're going to go through and actually get through. Mind you, I don't want to say that saying that, oh, like we have a 15% acceptance rate saying that, oh, like this is very discouraging. No, please don't get discouraged. Like, like I was saying throughout the webinar, like we are here to work with you because remember, we're students. All the content, ed copy editors, content editors, editorial team, managing editor, editor in chief, we are students alongside you. And we are also learning alongside you as well in the process through our um, direction and guidance and training from our faculty advisor, Dr. Anthony Benier. So I hope you don't get discouraged. In fact, I do hope that you do try to submit something for publication. And even if you don't get published, at least for me personally, that CRR is a very, very valuable document. 
if you think about it, like, when do you get, like, peer review like that um, by your peers in that kind of a detailed document? It is a very valuable piece of information that you can use, like, moving forward. Like, if you don't manage to get published here in Surge, but you do want to get published somewhere down the line, like, just think back to that CR that you received. It's very valuable. And Anthony, um, our faculty advisor, writes, Surge accepts scholarly book reviews. And hopefully that answers the book review question, like what I mentioned before to Michelle. And there's also another bit in chat. Sue is saying, for academic writing, it helps, and how to choose a great topic and question. The latest edition of the book called The Craft of Research. Looks very helpful. I wonder if we can put that on our journal website. Oh, it hasn't been reviewed yet, Sue says. Oh, that's that's a pretty good thing to write a book review about a way of how to write, like write and think about topics. And she also writes, it's not exactly an LIS book, but there are likely other venues to publish that review. Well, that's true. Again, if you have any other questions, like if you have a specific title in mind, um, feel free to email again. Email us here at Surge, and Holly, our editor-in-chief who monitors that email, will answer you. Okay, um, did anyone have any more questions? Okay, I do know it's already drawing on to 6 o'clock. I um, just want to recap my, again, just to help recap to drive home on a few more points. As a recap, like from my perspective as a content editor and from the way how we've discussed all of these five advice points that I presented to you tonight, don't leave your reader to guess what your thesis is. Remember to state it clearly. Don't offer a blow-by-blow -blow analysis of your cited studies. The literature review is not a report. Identifying numerous issues with the literature does not constitute a core question. You can have all the best sources in the world, but an article is not an article if you do not have a core question and a thesis statement. Have strong organization to guide the reader through a logical flow from thesis to evidence, synthesis to implications and takeaways. And check your work against the journal policies and required citation style. And remember, a decision of major revisions recommended is not a rejection of your manuscript. It's part of the editorial process. Your papers, they have potential. Your topics have potential. And reaching that potential will take time and effort. This is all a learning experience, and we can help you contribute your valuable voices to the wider academic conversation. And I do hope that my tips and behind-the-scenes perspective and my answers to your questions during our AMA can help you in your writing and your revising processes. I really do hope that you consider Surge as a viable avenue to publish your work. Feel free to submit your work to our email at any time. Again, like I've mentioned before, during the AMA, we accept on a rolling basis, and we publish biannually. Watch for the call of papers that periodically comes through our listserv emails as well. And as a souvenir for tonight, here is a handout of all the main points from 
this evening's webinar. And also, I'm going to be pasting in a second link right under that. I really want to solicit your feedback today with this Google survey. Please fill it out. It'll help me develop my presenting skills and future Surge webinar content as well. I want to thank everyone for coming out today, and special thanks to Holly, our current editor-in-chief, Lindsay, our current managing editor, Dr. Veneer, our faculty advisor, and the rest of my fellow editors for allowing me to present this webinar and supporting me while I develop it. If you're interested in doing what I've talked about today as a search editor, also watch out for a call for editors via listserv emails. I do hear that there are going to be some openings soon. Being on the editorial team has its benefits, and there's also potential here to generate ePortfolio evidence. Have a good night. I'll be around after concluding this recording to answer additional questions in chat. Thank you.